this is how we typically plan a lot of our new ventures. You know, we pick out the 80 page business plan and all the financials. We expect this thing to be extremely successful after some time. So, a better way to do this, and I think you'll see this for both today, is we start with something that actually works. Maybe it's, it's just a JS board, right? But then it can go to, what do we call these? Scooters, bicycle. Scooters? Motorcycle, and then there. And this, as you think about your startups and your ideas, I would have you think about how to make this happen. Bo went from basically uh, a leasing company to an operating company to a licensing company. He now has created this software that's licensed to um, uh, many other clients and users. As far as his background, Bo received his associate's degree from Dixie State. He has a bachelor's in business finance from BYU Idaho. He had a minor in IT, and his emphasis uh, was in entrepreneurship. Now, both served a mission to Russia via Latvia Stoke. Well, close, close. But it's Eastern Siberia. Uh, then he went back to school. Um, before that, he had served as uh, an international shipping and logistics manager at uh, Kiani. He also worked at Network Essentials as an SEO and PPC specialist. The most important thing I tell you about Bo is he is um, married, has a beautiful wife, two boys, a little girl, and um, it's a great privilege to have him here and uh, I'd like to welcome Bo. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, if there's one thing I want you to leave here 
from here today with is the knowledge that you know you don't have to have you know massive amounts of resources or, or great connections. If you, have a, if you have a good idea and determination, then you can build it into something that's valuable and meaningful and hopefully has a positive impact on society and becoming that. Um, so when I was going to school, uh, as Jason mentioned, I got my uh, my associate's degree from Dixie State, which is a small local school community college in St. George, Utah. That's where I grew up. Um, after that, I, I was hired from a company as a Russian translator when I got my mission, and they relocated me to Idaho. And in moving to Idaho, I worked there for about three years for a company called Kayani, as an international uh, logistics and shipping coordinator. And I quickly moved up the ranks there. I had a lot of ambition. And, uh, oh, I remember this, this experience that kind of pushed me to go back to, get my, to finish my education. And, and over a period of six months, we, I had working in that position within the company. It was kind of called Corporate America. Um, I'd say roughly a $100 million business. And we, we were um, basically going through and, and doing cost-cutting measures and, and renegotiating shipping contracts and warehouse Putting up, you know, uh, uh, warehouses in Mexico, Finland, and all over the world. And over the course of about six months, we saved the company about five hundred thousand dollars in costs. And in your business classes, you know that it, you know if you save money on the cost, it goes directly to the bottom line. And I remember I went in and I was petitioning for a raise, and I had a small family, and uh, I didn't get the raise. Like my petition failed. I thought I'd, I'd position my case, you know, very, very nicely, and I didn't get the raise, and so I was, I was a little upset and in frustration. I said, you know, I'm done. I, I quit. I'm doing something different, and which took me to into the tech field with a friend doing uh, uh, search engine optimization, and click uh, management, and really exposed me to a completely different side of business uh, with uh, in regards to technology than I had been exposed to before. And I went back to school, taking initially night classes, and then full-time enrollment, which led me into some of Jason's classes. So my path to getting to where I am today is very, you know, non-directional, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, paths that, that, that got me here. Um, it wasn't just a, hey, I knew what I was going to do. I climbed up the corporate ladder and had the right opportunity within the same industry. You know, I've jumped across different industries here. So, um, don't think that just because you have one failure, you're moving from, from one industry to another, that you're not going to be able to do something great or, or, or have success, because that's not the case, because I felt multiple times getting here. Um, so while I was in college, and I was, I was paying for college and, and providing for my family doing uh, tech-related things, and uh, I was in, enrolled in entrepreneurship management classes, and uh, I was getting my degree in business Finance, uh, emphasis in finance, and um, I was uh, connected with some guys that were working in the oil field in North Dakota. And at this time, so this is late 2010, early 2011, and I think many of you probably know about the Shell Revolution and the Energy Revolution that happened in the United States, and you know, a house that began in about 2000, we call it six to eight. And it was really picking up steam about this time. And I was working on some performance and some modeling and some different business ideas up in that space and had some exposure to opportunity up there. Um, I had no I had, I had no previous experience. I had no uh, base knowledge or education when it came to oil and gas uh, or the energy industry in general. And at the same time, I was you know, performance, models, and business ideas within that space. And that's where we're currently operating today. I would like to say I know quite a bit about it now. Um, so I remember I, there's so many things I can tell you about the importance of, of, of finishing your education. And I'm so, so grateful that I finished my education, and it is the most valuable thing that I consider that I have to my, to my name, which is my education and my family. Um, so I was I was working with uh, some 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 different people up there on some different business opportunities, and I was 
Okay, currently enrolled at the time in some of uh, Brother Earl's classes on entrepreneurship, uh, specifically new venture creation, which was uh, the three, 383, and uh, 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 entrepreneurship, man entrepreneurship management, which was um, 483. And those two classes have, I would attribute most of uh, the success of Trade Star to uh, those two classes. So I didn't really know how to build a business until 383, and I didn't understand how to uh, truly you know, be a true entrepreneur until 483. And all the while, as I'm working on these business models, you know, it was learn something in the classroom one day, apply it to the business model the next day. So we started and incorporated Trade Star in.
took this option, we got in line, and, and had basically had a kick in the line uh, for option on purchasing the, this high, this equipment that was a high demand to transport the oil. And the goal, uh, the goal at the time was to actually build the business to operate and independently hold master service agreements with these oil companies, move the oil for them, for a fee. And we're moving along nicely, and we had a, I had a class uh, similar to a venue like this, and uh, Brother Earl was actually the instructor, and he taught us about risk reward curves and how all risks are created equal, how all risks hold the same rewards, and taught some, taught some principles about how there's different strategies and different approaches to, to business hold different risks and, and have different rewards. And so after that class, I went home and started contemplating other options because I understood how risky that, the, the or I understood the risk associated with the current business model and approach to the business. So we, we started pursuing another option, which was actually becoming an equipment leasing company and leasing this equipment that was in high demand to, to other service providers that would have otherwise been our competitors. So we took our competitors and made them our clients as a equipment leasing company.
take the residual value of the equipment again, and it's a very simple valuation. You get your, you know, a simple discount of cash flow and all such to it. So we went from a, you know, very, you know, strict and rigid, you know, valuation approach to the business. What we wanted was a gratuity approach to the business. So all of these things, I'm telling you, I did not know when I went back to school. So I had no idea about you know valuations on acuity compared to you know you know leasing models. Do none of it. And all this I learned along the way. Uh, so we successfully started and we got our first contract, olive oil, for a direct uh, client. And in the middle of mid 2012. That obviously has since grown to you know, some of the majors in the industry like Snowcoats, Phillips 66, many of the, the people, you know, names, names that you guys have recognized today. Um, and we've uh, successfully grown since then. We've, we've expanded the business from originally uh, North Dakota into Montana and into Wyoming and Colorado. And this last year we expanded down into New Mexico and West Texas. So we basically run from the, and we all well in and out of Canada, so we run from basically the Canadian border all the way down close to the Mexican border. Um, at the same time that all this is going on and we're building this business and we're uh, growing this business, we were having challenges with uh, growth because of uh, limitations on transparency and uh, reporting accountability because of the lack of technology that lives in the space. So my previous experience with uh, a tech company, I had exposure to seeing how technology was applied to business. And I saw an opportunity, one within our own business, but also within the industry as a whole. And we, we began a new company Logistics. So we actually built our own technology suite because we went to the open market and said, listen, uh, we were sending drivers out to go basically pick up a load of oil and they were having a, a hand ticket. Uh, we could call it a hand ticket. Basically, a, a glorified paper seat that had five carbon copies tied to it. The driver had to take his hand and had to press full power, and the truck drivers generally don't have great handwriting and difficult to find. You can track, there's no visibility of where your trucks are located. So, we went and we looked for uh, technology suites that would enable us to do what we needed and wanted to do to scale the business, and we couldn't find anything that did what we wanted at a reasonable price, and I said, listen, I have, I have experience here, I know some people in this space, um, let's see what we can do for ourselves internally at a much cheaper cost than outsourcing it, and might create another opportunity, a vertical within this space. So we started with something very small, going back to uh, Brother Earl's um, uh, previous slide about an uh, MVP, a minimal viable product, and said, hey, initially, our product, all we needed to do is to you know create a load and track a load, right? We're going to use a hand ticket still, but we want to be able to basically create a digital tracking system, um, uh, somewhere like a QuickBooks, like a really kind of watered down QuickBooks with you know, more about a simple framework. And then after we're able to track loads, we want to be able to dispatch those loads. And we want to dispatch them out, and we want to be able to interact with that truck on a real time basis. Um, similar to like what Uber does for or Lyft does with all of the, the you know, uh, ride hailing apps that are out there right now. But this is for the crude oil space. So we we developed something. I mean, we had nothing, and we started with something. We built upon that, and now we license that out to a lot of our competitors to use our product. And a lot of our clients that are used to our product and love what what the our product has to offer, uh, midstream logistics, 
they actually require a lot of their other, which are our competitors, they require a lot of their other <coughs> carriers to license from us our technology. So we've actually created within our own business um, you know, a, a technology suite, which I can, I can tell you right now that the margins in technology are substantially higher than transportation. <coughs> So top line might be smaller, but the, the margins are much better. Um, so we've had success within technology. Um, and uh, um, come over here, I'll show you one of the, uh, here's some of our, our trucks right here, there's a drill rig. Um, there it is. Right here's the technology suite. So that case right there is basically what we ship out. It's a turnkey solution. Um, so there's no setup, no piece per setup. And in that case, you can see there's a, a Bluetooth thermal printer and an iPad with some paper. And you can literally take a truck that isn't part of your fleet, that isn't integrated with your fleet, you put that in the truck, and suddenly you can see where they're at, what they're doing, you know, what loads they're hauling, you can, and dispatch can interact with that truck, and they can be incorporated into the fleet literally within you know, half a day. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's, we will, I can promise you, we will, would not have been able to do what we've done without the technology, or the technology that we developed. So over time, we grew the company. Um, this last year, we closed the year out uh, close to $50 million in revenue, and all with the business that I was hoping we'd be able to do a couple million dollars of dollars revenue. Um, there's so many lessons I've learned along the way. Um, I was thinking about what to talk about today, um, what I could maybe help you with, or there's something that might, might leave an impression with you. A couple of lessons. I've, I mean, there's so many lessons I've learned along the way. I'm grateful for everything that I've learned. Um, one thing that I touched on earlier today is, and, and I'm going to touch on it right now, is, it, is the importance for me personally of uh, the partners that I have in the business. A lot of people will go say, "Hey, go it alone." I know that I've had personal conversations with my father-in-law. My father-in-law is a great man, uh, and he runs a successful business, and uh, I remember uh, multiple conversations with him that he's told me, do not partner with anybody. If you can pay someone to do it, then don't partner. Uh, then you don't need a partner unless they can do something that you can't hire down. Well, in this world, you can basically hire anybody to do anything. Um, and increasingly so, remotely, they don't even have to be local. Um, and for me, my personal experience has been that my partners have, in the business have been, have, in my opinion, have made the difference between being able to hit something that is a you know, four to five million dollar business to something that's going to be a fifty to hundred million dollar business. There was a, a class that that I was in, and I remember it was well, I think it's a, some pie charts that were shown, and the whole the whole lesson was about and takeaway was that a small piece of a large pie is often much bigger than a whole small pie. And, um, and I, I, can, I can attest to that today that you know, I, I honestly feel that um, it's, it's, and it's not only about the moment. I mean, when I, when I go to work every day and I work on um, you know, building a business, securing contracts, operational efficiencies and you know, looking at our ratios and basically managing the business, um, in my opinion, the money is the metric of measurement by which a business is measured. You know, you're successful or, or not successful on you know, in Wall Street terms, you're successful or not successful whether you're generating profit or not. And there's so much more that you can get out of your business than just monetary gain. And I have gained a lot of partners, uh, one of which was, his name's Kevin Tallman, he couldn't be here today, he was scheduled to be here today, and uh, this last week he's had some uh, family emergency uh, 
issues for that didn't go out and would not be here today. Trust me, you wouldn't be here. This place is beautiful. But um, I actually met Kevin in a uh, in a class that I was TA. I was the TA of the class, and he was just a bright. Uh, I always had bright comments on accounting questions, and this is all while while I was in college and. Uh, asked him to he could look at my books. Uh, needed some help with my books. The business had grown beyond my 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 202 accounting ability to keep my books, and uh, he graciously graciously accepted and looked in looked at my books and started keeping the books. And uh, one thing led to another. I'm like, listen, I don't know if I could do the business without Kevin, um, and he's fulfilled a much bigger role than I ever could have imagined sitting in that class, walking out first edition, the first time I'll walk up and say, hey, did you look at my books? Could you, you know, see what's going on? And not only from a business standpoint, but also from a personal, um, called spiritual standpoint. Um, there's been multiple times in the business where there's one, one, one uh, time in specific that comes to mind where uh, I remember I was in Houston, and the business was basically taking everything I had, and we're at a point in business where I'm like, is this worth it? Is, are we going to be successful? Are we not going to be successful? Can we make the right choices? Did, did, you know, so many questions were coming to mind, and uh, a lot of a lot of reflection on, on and I don't want to call it doubt, but you know doubt on. My own ability, and having somebody by your side that knows you in a way and knows what you're going through and is able to be there and support you when others are not. I can say that there's a good chance I might quit before we would have before we achieved the success that we did had I not had the right partners there side by side pushing at the same time and, and, and helping build the business. So that's my personal experience with partners. I know there's lots of people who say don't have partners. I say my experience has been very positive. Um, everything that I'm looking at moving forward um, and other ventures that we're looking at, I'm always looking at who's the right partner in this business. Because I, don't, I know I can't do everything and I can't be everything to everybody. And um, you know, uh, my personal experience is that we've been able to be you know, stronger so here on the right, here's a list of uh, some of our clients, Crescent Point, Enterprise, a lot of producer uh, uh, companies as well as mainstream companies. <coughs> our trucks and fleet. <coughs> Uh, Wikings 
come up here, we can look at um, know, where the drivers were by the last known location. Here we can see historical data, graphs, charts, a lot of different reporting features. And all of this started with not the, the, the initial product was that we could enter in a load and track it internally. We could dispatch it if we couldn't communicate with track and see where the drivers were. Here we can see, that, you know, here's our areas of concentration. We have drivers up here located primarily in North Dakota. Then there's the Colorado, Wyoming, and down here, uh, New Mexico and Texas. Those are on your address. Yeah. You can see by status, where they were last. So across North Dakota, this is like a part of uh, many of you who might know the Boston Automobile. So this is like the part of Boston Automobile um, you, when you hear it in the, the news. Um, I think it took about, uh, about seven more minutes, and I'm more than happy to open this up to Q&A. Um, and if you guys have some questions, and I can be asked a question. Yeah, so when you were like, getting this app started going, I, I guess it's not like just an app, it's like a program, but like, when you started getting into technology, did you just know what to do to start it up, or did you have to like, pay people to do it, or how did that yeah, start? So, so actually, we, uh, so great question. Um, so that, the same principles that we used to start at TradeStar, we used to start in stream logistics. We actually, actually recruited a developer, a senior level developer from Amazon, and uh, part, going back to the partner, partnership approach and offering an equity stake in the business. So this is what we want to do. Uh, I mean, we need to build this. We've got a solid job, but we're also going to monetize this as a standalone entity business. And uh, you know, now we have we actually have uh, two developers that come from Amazon and, and, and work and develop, develop for us uh, on a full time basis. So it's uh, yeah, we started it from nothing and recruited in some by offering one a job and then also equity to, to get them. How did you market your business? Um, the old fashioned way, which is just cold calling. So when we start, when I started TradeStar, um, I I can't count the number of calls I made that year one. The the one I didn't get didn't get returned. I got a no. I mean, I went six months. I mean, you can see back to that time chart. The first contract that we got was geez, eight months, no, a year after we incorporated it. So I really started a uh, marketing business from the trade store standpoint, which was about the beginning of 2012. We didn't get our first contract until June of 2012. So uh, knowing how this business operates, a lot of its relationship based. It's person face to face. It's I know you, so I'm going to do business with you. Um, it's, it's, I wish it wasn't that way, but that's how it was. It took up quite a while to actually get the contract and pick up students. With the Keystone Pipeline, have had a negative effect on your business? No, no. I, I think it actually would have a positive effect because it's just um, more oil in all the more locations. The oil still has to get from the wellhead uh, pipeline or a rail terminal. So whether it was the Keystone pipeline or a rail terminal, it had to be moved from the wellhead to the purpose. Um, you said you went cash flow positive in 30 days, which is incredible <laughs> yeah. um, for any business. How how were you able to do that? What were the, I guess what what do you think attributed to that success? Because that's really when you know your business is working. Yeah, so, uh, great question, um, and I ought to clarify that, but uh, TradeStar, that's when we were a leasing company. So the way that I instructed the leases was that when, the equipment, when we received the equipment, we already had a pre-leased out, so we had multiple people who wanted to lease the equipment, and we would collect, so I negotiated the contract, and the terms of the contract and the lease were that they had to pay on the first of the month when they received the equipment, for the, forward 30 days. 
then on the, the equipment that we were purchasing, on, on the cap lease that we were purchasing equipment with, we negotiated the terms so that at the end of the month, we paid 30 days after we received the equipment. So we actually received payment on the equipment before we ever had to pay for the equipment. So it, it's just the, the, you know, the Time. terms of payment is what it was. It was uh, just negotiating contracts in terms of payment. So we received payment before we had to make payment out and charging substantially more than we were obligated to pay for it. The greatest strength and weakness? <laughs> the giant. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I would, personally, you know, it, it's good to know yourself, and I actually do a review every quarter. Okay, where am I going? What am I doing? And one thing that I think, I, a strength that I think I have is, is being able to, um, I wouldn't say visualize, but be able to take lots of, of, of data in and have more strategy. So I don't consider myself to be really detail-oriented. I can be detail-oriented. I love spreadsheets. I love analytics. But I think my greatest strength is more being able to take a lot of data and analyzing the situation and, and looking at multiple options and multiple solutions to a problem and pursuing multiple solutions to that the problem at the same time. So that would be my, my greatest strength. My greatest weakness, I would say, is that it, it probably comes hand in hand with strength, which is sometimes I tend to be, um, I wouldn't say scatterbrained, but um, I can get distracted between lots of things. I try to take on more than I think I can do sometimes. So like, I try to like, OK, yeah, just more, more, more. And sometimes I'll get overloaded and have to step back a little bit and say, OK, let's throw it back. You said you were to the test How long do you think people are going to the break-even? The break-even point? For trades? Okay, so, I mean, we were cash flow positive uh, month one of the leasing business. A break-even point with the, the equipment is probably about 60 to 90 days. You said you do a, a quarterly review. Is that of yourself? That's myself, yeah. What are some questions or like elements that you include in that? Yeah, it was actually came from, uh, I'll give credit for it too, it came from uh, a guy named Ron Mikan. Uh, does Ron Mikan from Swanson? Yeah, so Ron Mikan from Swanson Capital, Luke Swanson, I think is the principal there. But he was at BYU Idaho. It was a, a similar venue setting like this. They had four or five guys that could come in. Um, and you talked about the difficulty in managing um, the work-life balance. And he said that every quarter he would do a review and say, like, hey, what are my goals? And the goals are written down. So I have a, a, a calendar reminder that comes up to say, what am I doing? What are my goals? Personal, spiritual, and business-related. Um, are we accomplishing those? Have those goals changed? Should we change those goals? Have, have my priorities in life changed? Adjust those goals and review them regularly so that uh, otherwise the, the goals is pointless. Uh, with oil prices going down and the boom of North Dakota, like the production of oil decreasing, how is that affecting your company? And if it is affecting it, how are you guys going to counteract that? Yeah, so interesting, like when when we see the biggest growth of our business was actually when oil prices started to decrease. So when, when that was like November of 2014, and October, November of 2014, oil prices started to, they've been cut by 70% now, but they've really started to, to take a nosedive. If you look at our growth, um, uh, about third quarter of, of 2014 is when we really started to ramp up. And a lot of that comes with, I consider it to be our value proposition, where you know, we have competitors in the space. If we provide more value, we, we all of our, we consider our transportation costs to be less, our value to be superior. So when oil is at $100 a barrel, 10 to 15 cents, these guys, you know, these guys are like, what's 10 to 15 cents? It's not even, it's a tenth of a percent. It doesn't matter. 
you know. But now, 10 cents, 10 to 15 cents is a make or break for these companies. So in many ways, it has actually made us more competitive. You know, it's brought along its own challenges where instead of in an expanding industry, we're in a contracting industry. But we continue to see growth even inside of the contracting industry, which, you know, we met with lots of different, you know, um, peers out there. And they're, they're quite amazed that we continue to maintain and have growth opportunities while everybody else is either going bankrupt or closing their doors. Uh, so you said that uh, oil business is very up to the base, like I know you, so like all the business with you. So as someone who didn't know anyone, uh, what techniques did you use to, to break through that? Because these guys seem like cowboys, they seem like people who don't have said on the internet, on Facebook, on Twitter. Yeah. So uh, you know, how did you make that connect? Uh, so I, I, I kind of broke into the space by just old fashioned cold calling. Um, I, as I mentioned, I served a mission in Russia where you would track them all in hours with very little success. It wasn't uncommon to track 14 to 16 hours a day without a without an invite in. And um, I don't want to say that compared to you, but you know, like your your success today doesn't determine your success tomorrow. And so there was that's why it took six months. I mean, I can't count the number of times I got the notes that yeah, we're not interested. You know, um, but just understanding how to position it in a way that you know, being a good salesman. I mean, I had to sell the business to, to get business, and um, you know, I, I never lied, I never misled anybody. Um, but I got my foot in the door in places where I'm like, I probably should have got my foot in. And you know, it took, just took that one, one, off, one opportunity and that one connection and led to others. Um, when you first started, you said you didn't know really anyone, and you raised capital through friends and fools and family, right? Who, what, is the, what was the best source of, I guess, raising capital for you and for someone that has basically no real connections to someone? Um, so in this space, um, t today I think it depends on your idea, it is what I would say, because there's so many like you know, crowdfunding you know, platforms out there now with Kickstarter. That, you know, you can get funding in ways that previously were, I mean, when I was in school, I don't think we could ever talk about that because it just wasn't there, it's so new, um, which is great. Um, so I don't think my idea would be a good travel to have to a business, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a, a lot of great people involved that, that I, I came to know through contacts and relationships, people that were willing to trust in me to build a business. Um, and, and does that answer your question? Like, I'm, I'm trying to direct it back, like, if you have a business idea here. Um, what about okay. So, everybody here knows a doctor. Who here knows a doctor? Who here knows a dentist? Who knows an anesthesiologist? Someone in the medical field? Probability is they have amounts of capital um, that they're always looking to deploy with great ideas, um, you know, to great ideas and, and, and people that are here to build a business. That's kind of where I started. People that I, I mean, I didn't know that they had capital, but I would approach them, um, hey, I'm building this business, I'm a college student, um, you know, I'd love to go over some numbers with you, and, you know, stuff like, you know, just basic intro, and uh, I remember I was at a father's and son's one time, and the conversation came up about what I wanted to do, and it was a, he was an anesthesiologist in our ward, and you know, I had, I didn't go there with any intention of trying to raise capital, or, it's just, those opportunities will come up, and, I don't know, just, I don't think there's like a direct path to do this, do that, and just, they just kind of come up, understanding you, yeah, we have some key guys in the market for the rotation. Any other questions? I think I've one more last question. You said you've had success with uh, your partners. So what is it that you, you look for in a partner that helps you find that? Um, for me, 
Uh, there's a couple of key things that I look for in a partner that it might be a big difference. Uh, one is that they're not motivated by money. And so, and I consider myself not to be motivated by money either. I definitely think that dollar amounts in the business are very important. This needs to be profitable. Um, so, having the correct motivation in life, the uh, uh, work ethic. So, having someone that, that's partnered with you that can either work as hard as you, smarter than you, or harder than you. So, you don't want to be partnered with someone that you feel like is constantly pulling along. Um, and then the other one is just a uh, kind of the same but they're uh, just ethics. So, Thank you.